Hello everyone, Sam here with the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group presentation on applying test-driven development techniques while coding in assembly language. I'll start off with a bit of non-sequitur introduction intended to segue into the meat of the presentation. This is intended to get your thinking gears in motion and kind of sets the theme for the rest of the presentation. All the big presenters seem to do it. It's a, it's a thing, apparently. I'll then provide a review of test-driven development and why many programmers feel it's important. If you're already familiar with the what's and the why's of test-driven development, you're free to completely skip this segment of the video. You really won't miss much. From there, I'll discuss my current project's code structure, which is useful only because well, when I actually start demonstrating the test-driven process in earnest, I'll need to make decisions about where to put different pieces of the code that might seem arbitrary. Knowing how the code is laid out will help you understand why I'm making the choices that I do. But, again, if you don't particularly care about this, you're free to skip ahead to the actual coding segment of the video as well. Penultimately, I'll actually work some code. I'll demonstrate the process using Z80 or Z80 assembly language programming, and you'll get an over-the-shoulder view of the workflow. Although the example used is chosen for its simplicity, thus making this video a more manageable length. This will be actual code that makes it into the finished project. And finally, I'll wrap up by recapitulating what I just told you now, because I think just ending a video cold without a conclusion just kind of seems wrong thing to do, and is borderline rude in my view. Each segment of the presentation will be timestamped in the description of this video, so you'll be able to skip ahead any segment you like, or rewind, go back to review if you want. So with that, I'm going to get started. So why do we invent tools? Why is our species unusually predisposed towards tool making? Perhaps if we look at a set of different types of tools, we can find something in common between them. Let's start by considering a simple wrench. Now, wrenches grants its wielder significantly greater torque than we could ever apply with our own hands. The clever application of leverage often makes quick work of dislodging even the most persnickety of steadfast fasteners. However, I don't think I would be alone if I didn't cuss like a sailor when the jaw of my favorite spanner fell off or loosened to the point where it would just no longer grip the nut. Everyone who's ever used a wrench has experienced this frustration at some point in their lives. Now, moving right along, let us now consider contemporary 3D printers. These glorified, robotic, fine-tipped hot glue guns allow us to manufacture bespoke components easily and relatively affordably, even for mass-produced gadgets. It's frequently the case that a quick 3D print will save a ton of time because you can do things like make test fits to see if your product actually meets its physical requirements. A 3D print can also serve as a positive for a mold, allowing mass manufacture to occur that much more quickly and that much more easily. But failed 3D prints is considered a frustrating fact of life amongst 3D printer owners today. Filament can be pretty expensive at times, and it's known to be pretty finicky to store. It turns out that PLA and other materials suited for 3D printers can absorb moisture which ruins their desirable properties. Extruders can also suffer from abrasion damage at the worst of times. Then there's the regular alignments and calibrations you need to perform to make, the, make sure that the rest of the mechanism works without too much slop. Failure to perform these regular maintenance tasks can yield some terrifying results. Imagine investing in a 24 hour long print only to have it go completely Lovecraftian with only 30 minutes left. Now, telescopes allow us to observe features of the distant universe that surrounds us, all without having to leave the comforts of our home planet. Visions of stars and distant galaxies are both beautiful to look at and scientifically valuable. Yet, one of the largest tool letdowns in my conscious memory came when the Hubble Space Telescope revealed some of its very first images. You see, the primary mirror of the telescope was misfigured sometime before it was deployed, and therefore had blurry images. There were serious debates going on at the time, whether or not we should just scuttle the mission right then and there, or if we should devise, you know, use one of the planned uh, um, spacewalks 
to fix it. Thankfully, the latter approach won out, and the telescope actually needed uh, to have corrective optics installed. Literally, almost a set of glasses for the telescope. But considering the cost of the shuttle launch at the time, it essentially doubled the price of the telescope. So what's common across all three types of tools? Well, they all can fail under seemingly nominal operating conditions. And when they do, those working with these tools experiences grief and frustration. And that's the best of it. What's desired in all of our tools is a kind of repeatability of quality. So I put forth the argument that repeatability is the answer to that question. Some might say reliability, but I think these two things are so intrinsically related that I consider them to be the same concept. Tools allow us to create new things precisely because they are reliable. That is, I can repeatably rely upon them. It is this property of repeatability that allows us to make resource estimates, cost estimates, plan manpower needed to achieve a goal, and indeed to even predict the, pre the repeatability and reliability of the tool which we are trying to make using the tools that we currently have. So what does repeatability have to do with programming? Now consider these two situations. Situation one, you're a professional programmer working an average of eight to ten hours a day. There's a ton of interruptions. You have to perform code reviews for your fellow developer. You have technical support tickets to respond to and you have meetings to attend. All those meetings. By the time the end of the day rolls around, you have maybe, I don't know, two to three hours of actual programming time invested scattered throughout the day. There are blog articles upon blog articles describing the negative impacts of this very situation. So this isn't entirely hypothetical. I've experienced it for real myself. And nonetheless, you need to get those things done and you still need to manage to pump out code at a reasonable and preferably predictable rate. Your project manager doesn't care how tired you are at the end of the day. All they care about is whether or not you can meet your requirements in a scheduled time. How then do you keep juggling all these things in your head and stay focused? Well, I can tell you right now in Silicon Valley, most people tend to work 60 hour days, but 60 hour days? No, that's not right. 60 to 80 hour weeks, let's put it that way. That seems more reasonable and jives more with my experience. But let's also consider situation two. You work manual labor for most of the day and you're too tired for any other interests during your normal work week. But on the weekends, you can probably invest three to five hours packing on a side project. How do you make the most efficient use of your time? Here again, the problem of interruptions are made manifest, arguably even worse than in the day-to-day -day interruptions you find in a professional programming job. You've got family obligations, you've got life obligations, you know, you need to pay bills, run errands, that sort of thing. I hope it goes without saying that spending too much time debugging your weekend software instead of developing new and more interesting features would quickly wear you down possibly to the point of just giving up altogether. I know I've been there and have experienced and, and almost done exactly that several times. Unfortunately, the phrase repeatable process is something of a bad word in most software development communities these days. Carnegie Mellon University once had an actually still has an initiative called Software Engineering Institute responsible for creating the off-maligned Capability Maturity Model, or CMM for short. CMM eventually begat CMMI later on, but that's immaterial, and for our purposes, they're both essentially the same thing. Anyway, CMU's heart was in its right place. They wanted to study and catalog the methods used for writing very reliable software at maintainable, and therefore repeatable, productive productivity levels. Excuse me. This research was informed by work done on mission critical applications like avionics software for aircraft and spacecraft, various medical applications, military applications, and big budget science applications. 
you know, the kinds of things that folks at CERN do for the Large Hadron Collider. They also studied what not to do by looking at a number of projects which can be said to have failed either in the market or when measured by their ability to, do, to deliver on promised goods and services. The thing is, CMU found that these processes actually worked. They really did deliver on their promises. So SEI set about the task of advocating for wider adoption of these processes, maybe in slightly modified form. However, they looked over a critical flaw in their thinking. Practices that work well for a certain size project don't always scale up or scale down efficiently. Even though the documentation behind CMM and CMMI do make allowances for different practices and different types and different sizes of problems, their advocacy failed to consider this scalability issue. As a result, commercial companies tried to adopt these practices, often using vastly over-engineered processes for the wares that they produce. A typical developer would only go through maybe a cycle or two of this heavyweight process before feeling utterly burdened by them. This left a very, very bad taste in the mouths of developers across the globe. So what's needed is something that isn't just repeatable, but also lightweight. Small enough to carry in your back pocket, so to speak. A screwdriver, not an impact wrench run off of an air compressor. And that's where test-driven development comes into play. Now, on its own, TDD is not sufficient to develop the next generation of big science or flight avionics package. You'll need a lot of other development practices to cover those applications, unique needs. But for the typical home computer or web services application, it has shown to scale remarkably well, ranging from small one-off projects like the one I'll be working on today, all the way up to significant organization impacting applications such as the Chrysler Comprehensive Compensation Tool, which served as Chrysler Corporation's human resources software of choice for many years. I'm going to introduce test-driven development by talking about four rules of TDD. They're called rules because it's easier than saying the four rules of thumb of test-driven development. You see, the of thumb is implied, but as with learning any new skill, you should think of them as rules to follow until you gain enough experience to know when and where breaking the rules makes sense. Okay, the first rule of TDD is when working on a new feature, you must always write a test for it first. In Ket Beck's extreme programming, this is what's called test first by intention. Now, why would you do this? Well, the purpose of the test is to exercise a single feature, and that feature doesn't exist yet, or at least so you think. So the first step is to make sure that it does not, in fact, exist. And when you're starting out with these small examples, it may seem like you're wasting a bunch of time. But you don't start to see the value of this step until you start working on larger projects especially those being worked on by many different programmers at once. Consider, if a new feature test compiles successfully, you know that you're using symbols for functions and types that already exist in the program. So, are you really sure that this is intended? Are you absolutely positive that you're not trying to use or abuse an existing symbol into serving a purpose it wasn't originally intended for? The larger the code you're working with, the more likely this situation comes up. So get used to verifying initial tests failing for now. Remember, these are rules of, of thumb, not immutable laws of nature. I mean, if you intend to reuse an existing symbol, then it's okay if your test initially compiles or even passes, as long as you have a full understanding of why. But if you compile and run your test and it passes and you're like, oh, that's a surprise. Then you you made a mistake somewhere and that needs to be remedied. Now, once you have a failing test, you can now be certain that the feature you're looking for in the code does not exist or has some other undesirable behavior. Perhaps your test is exercising a bug report for an existing feature, for instance. 
The next step is to write the code and just enough code to make this test pass. I want to reiterate, you write just enough code to make the test pass. The code doesn't need to be perfect. In fact, ugly brute force sophomoric code that works is vastly more preferable to elegant tapestries of inscrutable logic. If you have to, go to Stack Overflow, copy and paste. You don't understand the nature of a problem, then you know use a bunch of if thens and and you know kind of piece together a state machine that that mimics what needs to happen, right? Never try to predict the future. Both Kent Beck and Chuck Moore agree on this, so much so that both of their aphorisms have become staples in programming lore. Yagni from Kent Beck, short for "You aren't going to need it," and Chuck Moore's advice in Thinking Forth. No hooks. Solve the problem you have. Okay, you've written a test that failed, and now you've written some code to make that test pass. Feature-wise, your effort has paid off. It works. But now you're left with a bit of code that you know could be structured better. I mean, after all, it's brute force sophomore code, right? So perhaps you should rename a function or a data type to be more representative of what it's intended for. And perhaps now you see the need for a hook here and there to replace a tangle of if statements with, say, a little bit of polymorphism. Last but not least, perhaps your code sits in a giant function or procedure spanning several screens or pages, which is definitely hard for even you to read. Well, guess what? Now is the time for you to perform what's called refactoring. Now that you have a test which exercises your feature, you can relabel variables and functions, restructure complex if statement logic, all without fear of damaging the program. The key to doing this is to always remember to rerun your tests after each cleanup change you make so that you can double check and make sure you didn't accidentally introduce a regression in the code. Now at this point, you can check your code into source control system of your choice. Your feature is done, you can be proud of the quality of the work that went into it. But what's next? Well, if there's more features to implement, you just start over. You see, these three rules of thumb, if followed sequentially and iteratively, are all you need in a software development process for writing robust, moderate scale software. Now, to handle larger scale software projects, you often add to these development practices. For instance, extreme programming can be seen as something bolted onto test driven development. But they still form the core of more sophisticated processes, even if it doesn't you know, look like this. For example, if you're a fan of SEI's, uh, one of SEI's favorite processes, the clean room software engineering process, you might not think of it as a test-driven approach. But every time you enumerate your input stimuli and your output responses, and mark off which is invalid input conditions and which ones are the same as previous inputs, then what you're really doing is enumerating all the unit test cases. They just weren't called unit tests. One more word of advice. If you must attend to an interruption, make sure you switch contacts only after writing a new test and have confirmed that it fails. A test that fails is an outstanding reminder of where you left off when you came back to the project. However, never ever commit code to your revision control system with broken tests. A much better way is to remove the broken tests and corresponding feature implementation logic instead. Unless you're on a personal development branch, in which case you can pretty much do whatever you want. A clean checkout of your code may not yield a finished product, but it should always work. Never crash and always be in a shippable state within the context of what's actually done, of course. So I hopefully sold the idea of using test-driven development, showed how it was fairly lightweight and how it can be easily reused. What tooling do you need to make all of this actually work, though? It turns out you don't need a lot. 
Most books on the subject are written with enterprise class programming languages like Java or C-sharp and or make use of terribly complicated unit test frameworks like CPP unit. Ignore all of that. You don't need it. All you need is a way to build software the same way repeatedly and to be able to print error messages. In fact, I'm going to demonstrate this using nothing more than assembly language for an outdated processor, the Z80, on an outdated operating system, CPM, on an outdated home computer environment, the Commodore 128. First, I'll start by demonstrating the project that we'll be contributing code to. It is an experimental fourth environment that I'm writing, in part to support my VDC2 core project that runs on an FPGA for the RC2014 I have sitting in my garage. However, working directly with the RC2014 remains fairly inconvenient, so I'll be using the Commodore 128 as a surrogate development platform to help speed things along. Like my RC2014, it runs the CPM operating system, and since I'm targeting the VDC chip, we'll need to use the 80 column screen. Since I'm running this in an emulator, I can always use warp mode to accelerate all the sluggish floppy disk access. When VDC 4th starts up, you can see the layout of the screen. The OK prompt readily accepts up to 77 characters of input text. Note that the cursor movement isn't implemented yet, so you can't advance to the beginning of the line and then jump back to the end. You can only type characters and backspace. You can also hit the Enter key to submit the text to the outer interpreter, or rather what will eventually be the outer interpreter. You see, the outer interpreter doesn't exist yet. It's a feature which remains to be implemented. Now, to get the software onto CPM in the first place, I need to put it on a CPM-compatible disk image suitable for the virtual Commodore 1571 disk drive. And I use a package called CTools for that. It's available on GitHub. Links will be in the video description, of course. And this package does require a C++ compiler to build it, so make sure your GNU or CLang C++ uh, toolchain is fully installed before you build this program. Now I'm writing the software in assembly language, and the assembler of choice comes from this package, Z88DK. This is a C compiler software development kit for a wide variety of Z80 based platforms, and it too is available on GitHub. Um, Fortunately, the assembler lacks built-in support for macros, which makes sense since it's intended to be used as the backend for one of the C compilers in Z88TK. So to make up for that deficiency, I use the standard macro preprocessor that comes with all Unix-alike operating systems, M4. And as you can see on the screen, I tie it all together using good old-fashioned make. Now, looking through the source code, you'll notice that all of my unit test programs start with the letter T. There's no specific reason for that. It's just a convention that I arbitrarily settled on. I currently have two unit test programs written. TVDC, which exercises the display-related functionality of the program, and TCMD line, or T command line, which exercises the data buffer logic used to hold the command line input. Each of these tests co-resides with the software that they're responsible for testing, so they're always just a stone's throw away. In the use case directory, you'll find software is broken up by, well, use cases. Now this is my first time trying to organize code by use case, so I'm still learning here, and I'm bound to get many things wrong. But the idea, as I understand it, is that a use case describes a single human interaction with the software, a case study if you will, of how the software is used. Each use case is organized into its own directory, allowing me to focus only on the code relevant for that set of features. In use case slash command line, you'll find the code responsible for implementing the OK prompt and the command line input you saw earlier. In use case slash startup, you'll find the code that initializes the whole program and kicks off the main event loop. You'll also notice that in each use case directory, I put a text file that describes each use case. If you're interested, you can pause the video and read this one. In the drivers directory, you'll see code which transcends any single use case. This software is organized by device, 
by operating system or by some other facet with cross-cutting concerns. The main idea behind this logic is to isolate use cases from platform-specific details. For example, in the VDC directory, you'll find device drivers for the Commodore 128 and for the RC2014. The VDC chip and my VDC2 core are very nearly compatible with each other, but there are some differences which need platform-specific attention. In the OSAL or OSAL directory, you'll find a thin veneer on top of uh, the CPM system calls. And by thin, I literally mean that all they do is just delegate directly to CPM. If I wanted to later port VDC forth to run on bare metal without any kind of system software installed at all, in theory, I need only rewrite this module. Likewise, if I wanted to port VDC forth to an alternative platform that does not run CPM, such as TRS-80's Model 3 running under Tristos, this module would be the key uh, component to be replaced. Generally speaking, most of the other program logic should not require any further modification. Finally, we have the top-level code, which by way of cleverly placed include statements, is responsible for tying everything together into a single binary file, which eventually becomes vdcforth.com. This style of software construction eliminates the need for conditional assembly and is directly inspired by the advice offered by Leo Brody in Starting Forth, advising the reader to structure their code into sections and chapters. To create a top-level file for a new platform or hardware configuration, you basically copy vdcforth.asm into a new file specific for that platform and customize the include statements within and then assemble it. Okay, so we're at the point where we're going to be doing some live coding and I'm now completely off script. So, this is going to be like the third time I've done this, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to start off by launching my text editor. If I remember how to do it. <laughs> and then I'm going to navigate to my project. which I've done so many times, I basically memorized it. Okay, I'm going to start off with the make file, and then I'm going to do a test. Now I'm just going to pick in any, any arbitrary test. Um, I'm going to call it T stir equal. This is going to be an M4 file <clears throat> because we're going to be needing to use macros. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to insert a file. I'm just going to take from an existing uh, uh, test case. So basically we're going to start off with a test which does absolutely nothing. Um, this is in a sense basically testing that we have added our stuff to the make file correctly. stir equal dot asm dot m4 that's going to be in the current directory mainly for convenience sake we will move it to its final resting place um, afterwards <coughs> Okay. 
So we want to add to the rule that basically throws all of our .com files into the CPM image. And then once again here, I am going to copy and paste basically. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Command line with stir equal. Uh, oops. Well, that's not a problem. <clears throat> All right, so theoretically, I should be able to. that so that we don't have to wait too long. And it did not go on the uh, disk image. Which brings us back to needing this. If we go back up here, oh, there we go. That's what it is. T-Stereo.com. We do that. So now, theoretically, it should work. test which does absolutely nothing but it does confirm that our build process is in working order. So now that we have that we can actually start adding features. So I'm going to quit out of that, switch back to my editor. Let's see here. Okay so the first thing to consider when comparing strings um, now, these, the strings that I'm comparing are fourth style or Pascal style strings. They are counted strings. The first byte contains a, um, an unsigned 8-bit quantity, which indicates how many bytes uh, following that contains uh, relevant data. And so it stands to reason, therefore, that if the strings are of differing lengths, they cannot possibly be equal. So I'm going to start by implementing a simple test case for that. So I'm going to switch here. I'm going to say um, strings with different lengths. Now, I'm breaking this up into subroutines, um, mainly for organization purposes. It's not immediately apparent why I would want to do something like this right now, um, but it will become more obvious a little bit later on. Um, but you don't immediately have to do it this way if you don't want to or don't have to. Um, there is no particularly um, right way of, of starting out with a fresh uh, fresh set of tests. But as you add more tests and you gain more experience, you're going to notice certain patterns in how you write tests. And so I'm just kind of, uh, I'm kind of going with that pattern already. Um, and that's mainly due out of habit. But um, yeah, don't, don't let this, uh, uh, and actually, uh, just to stick with my convention, um, don't you know? Don't be um, 
intimidated into following this this structure. Okay, so this is the more relevant thing. Strings with different lengths cannot be equal. So I'm going to add a macro here to for to identify a test that basically says the same thing. And this is mainly just for uh, mainly just for human convenience. There's no particular reason why I have to duplicate things. I could, in theory, just leave it at that um, because when the test fails, it'll tell you which source file and which line number um, that test is is uh, relevant towards. So um, it's not like you're you're um, it's not like you can't find the missing test or, or the failing test. So this is just for human convenience more than anything else. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm now going to start parameter passing the strings. Now, the parameters or the pointers that I'm configuring here, I'm just I'm just um, arbitrarily picking uh, a set of locations. I have, um, let me take a look here, drivers data.asm. So I've got a set of, uh, you know, generic parameters, pseudo registers sort of thing. Um, so I'm basically I'm just using these and other components of VDC fourth also uses these. But for now, R0 and R1 will, will suffice for our needs. All right, so we set the strings, and now I'm going to call string compare. And the results of that function, I'm going to say right now, arbitrarily, because that function doesn't yet exist, I'm going to say that I want to return a zero in the accumulator if the strings are equal. And since the accumulator will already have the value we want, I'm going to set the actual side of the comparison for the test um, by calling that procedure there. And I'm going to test it against the expectation that it is not zero in this particular case. So test not equal. And that should be sufficient to make a test. Now, in this case, if we try to build that, we're going to find a number of things missing. Obviously, I have yet to uh, declare string one and string two. But you'll notice that R0 and R1 isn't defined, right? Because I forgot to include it. So not a problem. I'll include that. Make run again. OK. So strings with different lengths. I'll say you got a string of length two and a string of length five. All right, so string compare not defined, which is what we expect because I haven't implemented it yet. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is in support of interpreting the command line, so I'm going to place the code there. I'm going to call it strings. Now, we're definitely expecting the test to pass if the strings are different. So let's create it so that it is, we assume that the test, uh, well, let's create it so that the test fails. And so let's go ahead and that oh what did I do? Let's try. Let's see, 
Use case, command line. Use case, command line, string slash hazard. Okay, I'm just going to warp through this. Strings with different lengths cannot be equal. All right, so we know that our unit test program is running and, and working. So now we need to actually implement the logic that returns uh, unequal strings in the event that they have different lengths. <coughs> so I'm going to switch over here. It is as simple as that. Strings with different lengths cannot be equal. Why did that happen? Did I get an assembly error? Definitely not an error. Well, if it ran the emulator, there's no error. Uh huh. Okay, so there's that. There's that. Yeah, string equal.com. This should definitely be passing. What am I missing? Well, that's that's one thing that needs to be fixed in the uh, the make file. Do that again. Okay, well, I don't understand what happened there, but it's, it's working now. <laughs> so I'm going to continue on. And that obnoxious noise that you're hearing is actually the fan to my laptop. And I apologize for that in advance. Okay, so we have a working test. Even though our implementation for this is pretty abysmal. You know, basically it just returns a hard-coded constant. But hey, it makes the feature pass. And remember, this is supposed to be brute force sophomore at code. Nothing elegant, right? So now what's next? So now what we're going to do is, since this code already returns that the strings are different, we now want to make a test where we expect strings to be equal. So... That is going to be here. You can say strings with equal length and content. And I'll say equal content. Here it is a separate string because I want the worst case involved where you're dealing with different addresses.
this case, we want them to be equal, so we're going to call test equal. And that should be sufficient. I'm going to warp through this again. Strings and matching links and content must compare as equal. Excellent. That is what I expect. So I'm going to exit out of that. Switch back to the editor. Now, if you're going to think that you're going to be clever and switch that to back to zero, obviously that will make the previous test, the, the very first test that we implemented, fail. Right? So we don't want to do that. So now we're going to have to be maybe a little bit more clever. So now we actually, so we'll get the length in the accumulator A. We'll compare it with the length of the string in HL. If they are not equal. And I'll load zero with A. All right, so let's give that a shot. Still getting back zero. Oh wait, strings with matching length and content. Why are, oh, we're not getting back zero, we're getting back one. Okay, if they are not equal. What is going on? Why is this happening? String two, string three. I swear to God, the previous two times I've recorded this video, this went so smoothly, unbelievably smoothly. And now all of a sudden this is happening. I don't understand why. It's almost like this Z80 emulator is just not emulating the Z80 correctly at this point. We load A with the contents of HL, we load HL, switch HL to R1, we compare A against the first byte of R1. If they are not equal, then lengths differ. And if the lengths differ, we want to return non-zero. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct code. So if we make clean, that means that there's a problem with the make file. All right, what is the problem here? Okay. Ah, you know what? We didn't add this as a dependency. Use case, command line, strings.atlin. Okay, 
Okay, so that should still work. That does. Okay, and we're done with that as well. Okay, so we have two of the three features that define string equality for us, right? So strings with different lengths, strings with equal lengths and equal content. Um, so now we want to check strings with equal lengths but with differing content. So before, so as you can see, I'm going to make this make the very last character different um, as a worst case scenario. But as you can see. Um, Whenever a test fails for unexpected reason, or even for uh, an expected reason, um, you know, it's, it's an indicator that there's something wrong, right? Content is missing, um, or some configuration is not set correctly, etc., etc. So this, you've already seen that valuable, uh, seen the value of that so far. Strings with different lengths, strings with equal lengths and equal content. Strings with equal lengths and unequal content is the next one. And they cannot be equal. Now, unfortunately, we, we have two situations where they cannot be equal, so I'm going to demarcate them that, that way. So at this point, that should work. And indeed it does not. Okay. Now that we know that, we're going to go back to our editor, switch back over here. So now we can't we can't play games anymore, right? So now it's time to actually implement our core logic. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. So load A with a shovel. After we're done with that. Now, I don't remember if um, incrementing a register pair as distinct from a single register will set flags. So let's go ahead and test that. We should get the same unit test results. And we do. Outstanding. So now I don't have to worry about that anymore. So now that we know that they are equal, and now R0 and R1 uh, both contain a pointer to the start of the actual data bytes, and we know that the accumulator A contains the length of the strings. Load B with A, because we're going to use that as a byte counter. And I'm going to say stir compare loop. Oops. And I'm going to um, actually. 
going to uh, overload length differ for the time being as an indicator that uh, the strings are not equal. So let's go ahead and check that out. Three situations involving string equality uh, now work, so we are feature complete. That means we can move on to the last step of uh, working with um, uh, working with test-driven development, which is the refactoring stage. So now, what I'm going to do now, um, let's see here. Now I'm going to rename, rename that, which is a little bit more descriptive. Um, this is kind of uh, chintzy code, really. I mean, we're making an awful lot of memory access. This is unnecessarily slow. So we can actually optimize this a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say load HL with R0. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to load DE with that. We don't need that. And we don't need that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say put our source pointer in HL again. Someone more familiar with Z80 than I am can probably figure a more efficient procedure for this. But I think that will work, right? So as long as... Um, oh, you know what? We don't even need that. We can get rid of these. Nice. I like that. Let's give that a shot. Oh, it assembled. That's good. And it works. Look at that. Alright, so we cleaned up that code quite a bit. Um, and again, I think that there's probably quite a bit more. You know, if the strings are not equal, that means that their lengths um, Length bytes, by definition, are are, uh, not, are could potentially be not equal as well. So we really don't even need that. But we do need if we if we just uh, if we don't increment the pointers past the length bytes, then we have to account for that in our byte count. Um, so that's why that ink b is there. So let's give that a shot and see if that works. Do, do, do. There we go. 
I'm getting bored. There we go. Okay, so that works. Excellent. Any other refactorings that we can do here? <clears throat> I'm not immediately aware of any, um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch this into te uh, text mode, so that I can start writing documentation. do change register B and D, E, and H, L, of course, are pretty quite thoroughly trounced on. So yeah, that's about it right there. I think that will work for our needs. So now, the next phase of our Refactoring is to move the files to where they need to go. So let me move or into use case slash command line. And I'm going to update is basically done. Now we can go to our revision control system and we can start adding uh, our sources. And in this case we are introducing string quality check. And we're done. And that is how you use test-driven development at the assembly language level. Okay, let's see. I've shown you the current state of VDC4. And even though it's not finished, it still is in a state where the software does not crash even when it presented with bad inputs. Now, obviously, once the outer interpreter is finished and implemented, we can no longer make this guarantee as the nature of forth is completely open-ended and it's then very easy to crash the system but for now it's a pretty solid piece of software and this is what test-driven developers and extreme programming enthusiasts mean when they say that your product should always be in a shippable state it doesn't have to be feature complete it just can't misbehave within the context of what's actually finished I've also shown you the layout of the project structure, so you can see where and how the different pieces of code all fit together. I've actually illustrated the test-driven development process at the assembly language level, and did so without needing any sophisticated frameworks. I did have to write my own testing support library, but as you saw earlier, it's incredibly lightweight. A few macros in an include file and a small library makes up the entire testing infrastructure. 
So, yeah, um, I think that about covers everything that I wanted to discuss in this video. Uh, I hope that uh, this has been an informative journey for you, and I hope to give more presentations in this format in the future. Thanks for watching.